Hello, I'm Roger Bisbee from the Skill Builder channel and I just want to talk about a little trend that I've noticed in the building industry. Over the last few months, I've talked to quite a number of builders who have decided that they want to give up. Not exactly building, but working for customers. Now, they've not done this because they've won the lottery. They've done this because they've just got fed up with the challenges of working for customers. Now, in the case of James King, he's actually left the industry altogether. So some of those people that have stayed in the industry have started flipping houses. In other words, they've bought a house, they've done it up and they've put it back on the market and made the kind of profits that were previously made by the very people that were employing them. Now, I've always maintained that the building industry is a fantastic place to work so long as you don't have to make money money out of it. As soon as you have to put food on the table and bring home enough money to pay the mortgage every month, then it does become quite stressful. Because if you price a job and the materials go up and you've got to go back to the customer cap in hand and say, I'm afraid that the materials I estimated for in that job have now doubled in price. And the customer who is understandably stuck with their budget may actually think that you're just trying to take them for a ride. If you swallow those price increases, as James King did on many occasions, you find yourself not having enough money left to pay yourself. You can pay your men, you can pay for the materials, but you end up taking home absolutely nothing yourself. Now, from your wife's point of view or your partner's point of view, that may be a bit of a problem. And when you see the guys that are working for you taking home more money than you are, and you see the customer who is hanging on to their pennies and expecting you to pay for all the increases, and if you've got a partner who's also giving you earache because you don't bring home the bacon, then you start to build up some resentment. You resent your customer, you resent your people working for you, and you also resent your partner for not being an understanding person and understanding why you have to work for nothing. Very soon, you start feeling like a failure. And the only reason you're feeling like a failure is because you got the numbers wrong. Now, it's not unusual to get the numbers wrong. If you look at some of the big projects such as Crossrail and HS2, they get the numbers wrong and they don't just get the numbers wrong by a little bit. They get it wrong by a whacking 25%. You got Crossrail, which was originally going to cost £14 billion, ended up costing something like £18 billion. And we all know the story with HS2. Even though they've got a vast army of accountants, quantity surveyors and all kinds of professional people with qualifications who are going to be checking the numbers for them and making sure that the money doesn't go astray, they still end up coming badly unstuck. And not only that, but the job's run over by, well, not just months, but years. So if you're building an extension and uh, you've estimated that it's going to cost £100,000 and it ends up costing £125,000, that's one unhappy customer. So what very often happens when a job starts running into the red and you can't afford to pay your guys is you start another job to keep some money flowing through the till, keep your cash flow going. And that means that very soon your customer is going to see that you start disappearing off their job and you go somewhere else for a few days just to get some money. And if you're lucky, you can tell them a story such as, well, we're waiting for materials. There's a shortage of materials and the merchants told us that they're not going to be available for another month. So it's no fault of yours, is it? You can just string them along like that for a certain amount of time unless they're really savvy and then they start checking whether those materials are available themselves. That's the curse of the internet. There's no hiding place. As a customer, you may not really understand the builder's plight. You might have no sympathy. You might think that all builders are rogues. And to some extent, there's some truth in that. But there's also some truth in the fact that there's quite a lot of rogue customers out there. I would say now 80% of all builders I know are good guys. I mean, really good guys. And I would also say that 80% of my customers have also been good people. But of course that means that there are 20% of builders who are a little bit on the rogue side and also customers who are also on the rogue side. Now if we could get them together, if we could have that 20% meeting that 20%, we could lock them into the bullpen and leave them to it. But what very often happens is that rogue builders end up working for perfectly good customers. And some of those rogue customers end up with perfectly good builders. 
But actually, it's a lot easier to be a rogue than it is to be a good guy because when you're a rogue, you can sleep well at night. And that goes for customers too. Untroubled by conscience, they sleep the sleep of a newborn... Well, not a newborn baby, but, you know, a baby. One that sleeps. And believe me that if you are troubled by your conscience and you are giving the customer a bit of a run around, it soon starts to play on you. It's not very nice. But of course, if you end up working for a rogue customer and they start to knock you or try to knock you, then that's also very unpleasant indeed. And I've seen very good builders such as Dan Cox and Sam Ward and Kirk from On The Trails. And they've all been... Well, they haven't necessarily been knocked, but the customers have certainly tried to do it. And not because there's any fault in their workmanship. They could not fault their workmanship. But they just decided that the money they were due to pay the builder would be better off in their pocket. So they just kind of hung on to it and let the builder chase around to get it. And in some cases, that meant going to court. Now, as if rogue customers weren't enough of a problem, we've also got the problem of builders having all their tools stolen from the back of their van while they're asleep. Well, not even asleep. Sometimes while they're indoors doing the job, somebody's robbing their van outside. So when you've had that happen to you, not just once, but maybe two or even three times, and you've been knocked by a customer, it's little wonder that you're going to start looking elsewhere for a living now there are more people leaving the industry and there are joining it so any skill shortages we have are going to get worse so as we've got more builders leaving the industry than we have joining it it's inevitable that the prices will go up and then the sharks that are forever circling smell blood they want a quick killing and they join the industry and of course we all know where that ends you've got inexperienced people coming into the industry who don't care about anything but making money if you're a customer you may wonder why the industry is subjected to this kind of thing and why we're not better regulated well all i can say to you is it's been tried before and if you're a builder and you go to see a customer and the first thing that customer talks about when you get there is contracts and and guarantees and penalty clauses even before they've got the chocolate biscuits out of a tin then you're very likely to just make your excuses and leave or give them such a whacking great price that you hope you lose the job and this fear of contracts and all these restraints is not because you're a rogue but simply because you like to work on trust you want the customer to trust you and you want to be able to trust the customer. And if you can't trust the customer, you're off to a pretty rocky start and things tend not to get better from there. And let's not forget that trust is a very big thing or it used to be the motto of the London Stock Exchange was my word is my bond. And you used to do business on a handshake, but now that has just become a moralistic cliche. People really don't take it seriously anymore. And people don't trust politicians, they don't trust the BBC, they don't trust mainstream media, and they don't trust that person who rings you up on a weekly basis to say, hello, I'm your local energy advisor. And they certainly don't trust that bloke on YouTube that keeps ranting on about heat pumps. This episode is dedicated to Jim W, who pointed out that we're not using our green screen for its intended purpose. So I hope you enjoyed the background on this one. And all of you viewers, I would be interested to see what do you think we should put behind Roger? Maybe like a, a boiler room, a workshop. I don't know. Let us know in the comments what should be behind Roger. And keep it classy, for goodness sake. Yeah.